Welcome everybody, in this video we're going to take a look at minimal APIs in ASP.NET Core. There's a couple of videos going around, I think Nick Chapsas has uh, quite good videos and a bunch of blog posts, a bunch of people talking about it. And this video is really my two cents, the thing that I'm gonna try to outline here is why. Why should you be using minimal APIs and there's gonna be an additional video where I show you how to achieve what I'm talking about in this video. You should watch this video if one, you're not convinced about minimal APIs. I'm gonna try to convince you why you should use them. And two, if you just want to hear my two cents, right? Because it's a big bucket of opinions and everybody throws their two cents in it. Now I've heard about minimal APIs about a year ago. There was a guy that created a wiki website with one file that was, I think it was 50 or something lines of code. And he used this uh, Feather HTTP framework. And back then, I think he had it posted on Reddit as well, and you had a lot of people complaining already back then. People saw that and didn't like it, right? The comments were something like, oh yeah, it's good for prototyping, nobody, they don't publish this in production, nobody's going to use this in production, this is not real code, you can't have one file solutions. To, to some extent, yes, they're right, it is very unlikely you're going to have one file solutions, and... If minimal APIs do bring something to the table, your immediate reaction to disregard it because it's one file for now, you may be discarding all the good features that it may bring for one argument of your potential inability or just you don't want to abstract it into many files, right? For whatever reason, I don't know why. So anyway. Feather HTTP, uh, minimal APIs, they were in process for a long time and uh, today is the day we talk about it. Why? Because, well, I saw another tweet and the guy ran the API, essentially three lines, ran an API in Linkpad and I was like, well, really a no-brainer, case in point, right? Uh, that's it, case shut, uh, minimal APIs are overpowered and, uh, you know, there we go. API is running, we get debugging. If we want to, you know, you don't even need watch run because I mean, it takes like two seconds to start. Well, not even two seconds, it takes like half a second. But anyway, you get the point. I like Linkpad, minimal APIs run in Linkpad. I like minimal APIs, right? I don't need to open up Visual Studio, work with the laggy code editor, whatever. This is not, we're not gonna work on bashing Visual Studio. We're not gonna, I, mean, I just like, come on, come on. All right, anyway, let's close that. We're here for the good stuff. Logical explanations. Why do we want to use minimal APIs? We're gonna compare minimal APIs to production grade software, enterprise grade software, that real thing that you deploy to production to millions of computers and open source and multiple people working on the project. How do minimal APIs compare to that sort of project and what can minimal APIs really bring to the table? And the one thing that I just want to discard straight away that I, I think nobody in their right mind disagrees with is prototyping and educational purpose of minimal APIs, right? Prototyping, you, you build thing up, it's, you, it's, not a time, it's not a time investment, you just scrap something together and uh, throw it away later, right? Nobody disagrees with that. Education, I think there might be two or three people that might disagree with this, is the fact that you don't have your main function and uh, how are noobs meant to find out about the main function? Listen, the, the main function is an anomaly anyway. What the hell calls the main function? It's a convention, right? Uh, where does the args come from? How are people meant to find out? What? Sh shut up, right? It's not even like an argument. There are already like environment variables and you got to find out that those exist and uh, those are not defined in your program. So anyway, that whole argument goes out the window straight away for me. Uh, prototyping and education, minimal APIs are good, All right? So we put that aside. The main juicy bits is the production environment. How can we use minimal APIs in production environments? And moreover, what do they bring to the table that the current structure doesn't? Let's take a look at the minimal APIs. And I want you to look at this for a couple of seconds and pick out at least one thing that you think is good here. Now you can pause the video to think about it. Otherwise, yeah, I'm just going to carry on, right? We can just explain it. You can, you know, use your brain or just uh, absorb uh, my words. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was cringy. Anyway, catalog, blogs, admin controllers, right? You have your route and you have your what to do. The first complaint that you may say is what you do is not going to look like that. It's going to be at least uh, 100 or 50 lines long, whatever. It's not going to fit in here. 
it's instantly gonna bluster. This structure is not maintainable. I think that's rather a challenge than a complaint. The fact that we can get essentially what is a table of contents if we compare it to a book, okay? We open a book, we can see the table of contents. One line corresponds to one functionality that the API provides, okay? So it's a very efficient use of space, I think. Essentially, it's a definition for your API and it's one file, right? You open up program CS, you see what the API is about and potentially you can see pointers to where those routes are being executed, okay? So it, it is essentially a table of contents. So number one, table of contents for me is very, very readable. Let's take a look at what table of contents looks like in a production grade software, right? Program CS, uh, people sometimes put uh, logging initialization here. I mean, this looks different for everybody. Startup CS. Yeah, you, 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 you sometimes see big service registrations, sometimes smaller but essentially these are scattered all over the place and uh, you, can't, you can't really get a good gouge for what services are being used. And then for routes, again, you enter a function and you see map controller routes. Okay, we are using controllers. If we really want a sense of what routes we're using, we're gonna have to scroll through controllers and we're gonna say, right, customer controller. Okay, this is about 2000 lines long. In the, let's say, 40, 47 lines of code here, do you think there is 47 actions here that could fit in that 47 line and 47 lines and really define what this controller is about? I think there, there is less than 47 uh, actions on here and uh, yeah, I'm not gonna actually count it. But yeah, this is only one table of contents because there is actually an admins section and there are different tables of contents here. And again, I think it's uh, the same problem where you can find, uh, I don't know, we can just a short search complete. That was probably a bad example. Let's find a product controller. I'm cherry picking bad examples here. Uh, 3.5 thousand lines of long. The point is that this exists. And as you open the file, what routes do you have here? What endpoints do you have here? And what do they do? So you will have to search, you will have to use your ID box of methods and you probably at that point need to scroll it, right? Route definitions again are, is uh, like, yeah, these are not even actions or are they actions, uh, right? You need to look at the base admin controller. What does that do? You can see that the table of contents here, like the description of what your API is, essentially swagger for backend developers is a little bit hazy. This is what you get out of the box with minimal APIs. So first thing is table of contents. And again, this is a structure that we try to preserve. How we do it is going to be in the next video. Second thing, because we try to maintain this table of contents, we are going to avoid segmentation. And what do I mean by segmentation? This is probably an issue for more junior developers, but no, uh, I'm just going to say this is a mistake anybody can do. And it looks something like this. We have the admin catalog and it may end up here, okay? Or let's say we have blocks both, right? And it may end up somewhere here. Now with uh, this project, areas, admin, controllers, like the admin area is clear cut. Everything relating to admins is here. Uh, controllers for products for admin, basically for admin product controller management, Everything is here uh, for customers, the product controller, there is a separate product controller for customers here and it returns pro uh, customer related product information. Cool. There is a clear cut distinction here. The point is, is that areas like these ones and having this clear distinction between admin and controller, this sort of distinction, it's only one case of this distinction. There are many distinctions to make and many distinctions that you can organize your project by. And if you do not make conscious decisions to make these separations, you're gonna end up with this and it's just an organizational issue. Why not have a table of contents that essentially shows you <laughs> something is wrong. You read this and you're like, um, why, is, why is this here, right? When you're looking through a controller and we look at the catalog controller, uh, when you see this, right, you basically, you see a road, but you don't see where the road is. Is the road on a mountain? Is the road next to a building? 
uh, you don't see like its counter positions like you know like good and bad what makes good you need bad sort of thing so you don't see everything else around it that allows you to distinct what it truly is and maybe getting a little bit too philosophical here but slash admin slash catalog where does it go oh we have slash admin slash catalog probably goes somewhere here right and then uh, how do you organize these well that's again that's just something that you have to figure out uh, again slash admin slash blog oh yeah what does this do here uh, yeah move it somewhere here right and uh, this is something that could probably be detected quite quickly and uh, potentially you could have tests against uh, making sure that these are all in correct order as well. The fact that we have a table of contents is really good that basically says function name which is your route and what do we do on that function execution. The challenge here is to maintain the table of contents and still provide all the goodness that we had previously for the execution of this function. What goodness am I talking about? I'm talking about the things that you would register in your startup CS. I'm talking about validation. I'm talking about authentication. I'm talking about dependency injection. I'm talking about model binding, maybe rate limiting, right? All those things that sit around the action. In between when you receive the request and your action executes, all those things in between so that's what the next video is going to be about. And if you still don't get the picture, yeah, table of contents is the main reason why I think minimal APIs are going to be good and are okay to replace this controller structure with this just for the readability purpose. I think Nick Chaps has outlined that minimal APIs are more performant. I found that as well, but I'm going to count it as a side point, not a main case of why you should use it for performance. Although for some, it is a perfectly ac acceptable point. If it's more performant, yeah, I mean, and, and it's practically the same. Why would you not use it? For me, I'm going to pick readability and familiarity to the previous solutions. Find out in the next video how we maintain this structure and still reuse all the goodness from the previous world that we knew. If you have any questions or opinions about minimal APIs, ask them on my Discord server or in the comments section. As always, thank you for watching and have a good day.